topic of today is strain energy density. And these are three terms that those of us in mathematical and scientific disciplines should be pretty well familiar with by this point. Strain, of course, we usually think of as related to stress in the mechanics of material sense, right? You apply a stress, a force per unit area to an object, and then it undergoes some strain because of that, a deformation relative to the original length or size of the object. Energy, we think of as the ability of an object to do work. In the layperson's sense, perhaps that's the energy that you wake up with on a morning or, or the lack thereof on a Monday morning. And finally, density is a concentration of something, right? The most common would be the mass density, which is the mass per unit volume of an object. But we understand what all three of these terms mean on their own, right? So putting them together should come pretty intuitively, right? And we're applying this strain energy density concept to rock mechanics or more broadly the, the strength of materials field. So to actually get into it, I'd like to start us off by just drawing a stress strain curve. The classic stress strain curve. We'll have a little bit of review here. Remember the x-axis is going to be epsilon. That is, of course, the strain or the length that has been deformed relative to the original length of the object. And then the y-axis is going to be sigma, little sigma, or the stress, the force per unit area that has been applied to the object. Now, when we look at what this curve looks like, it's going to vary depending on your material. So we'll start with kind of what you might expect to see in other disciplines, which would involve engineered materials like metals, where you'll have some linear elastic region where it's deforming at a roughly uniform rate and then it yields and then it goes into the plastic region and you'll have some weird behavior up until failure and you have this big area where it's deforming a lot without the addition of much stress until failure right and that'll be failure and yield as two distinct points remember that rocks we get to simplify it a lot because rocks are effectively ceramic materials and they have a linear elastic region. They're going to be quite strong in this linear elastic region. It's going to take a lot to get them out of here. But once they do, they hit the yield right in here, and then, bam, failure occurs shortly after. Rocks and ceramic materials, you know, whatever it is, concrete, compared to, compared to a ductile material where it's able to have kind of ductile blunting of the microscopic cracks and things inside the material, Brittle materials don't have that, and so they fail shortly after yielding. And this provides us with a nice little mathematical simplification of the curve. You'd say that this is basically a straight line, and this straight line forms basically a triangle. If you look at it, if we draw kind of two lines here, you can look at it as a triangle either on this side or this side. We'll call this epsilon sub y, the strain at yielding, and then sigma sub y the stress at yielding and again remember we're treating yield uh, the yield condition as basically the, the failure condition of the material here because frequently it is very small amount after yield that fracture occurs now to get back to the point of all this the strain energy density is the area enclosed by this curve and I introduced this triangle concept because it's going to provide us with a nice little mathematical simplification. But we're going to get to that in just a second because we're going to start with the appropriate formal introduction to it, which involves a little bit of calculus. I know a lot of practicing people like to just take the shortcuts and they don't want to think about the higher math that's involved in anything. Uh, but it is useful to know that at the core of so much of the math behind science and engineering concepts is calculus or differential equations something like that right and so it's useful to remember where this comes from and so we will cover that here that that would be our due diligence wouldn't it so sed i used to represent strain energy density is going to be the integral from zero to the epsilon sub y the strain when it yields right remember we're integrating along the x-axis here and then what we're integrating is going to be the y function. So that's going to be just sigma. And then remember, that's going to be integrated over every differential epsilon, every differential change in the epsilon there, right? Every little slice that you could take out of there. 
So that's a fully set up integral, and if this function was a little more complex or we needed to be more nuanced with it, then we could absolutely, you know, approximate a function and solve an integral. But for our cases, because, like I said, this can be approximated so, so efficiently as just a triangle, uh, because of that simple singular slope condition with that Young's modulus completely being enclosed in the elastic region, we can simplify this, right? Effectively, what we have is, I'll draw it out here completely so you can see a triangle, and we have the length here is epsilon sub y and the height here is sigma sub y right and so then our simplification becomes just the area of a triangle and remember this area in here is also our sed so we'll shade that in the same blue that's our sed so our sed is going to be equal to just the area of a triangle one half sigma y epsilon y, the product of the stress and the strain at yield. So that's really as simple as it gets. And for one more practical application before I get into the fun stuff, which is kind of explaining the, the rationalization, how it's nice to remember this, I'll mention this is for just one direction of stress and strain, right? But in the real world, you know, like this could be a laboratory setting where we've got this uh, core of rock i don't know pick your favorite rock maybe it's a piece of granite maybe it's a piece of limestone and it's being compressed uniaxially and that's and that's all well and good but in the real world that same core of rock if we draw our axes here we'll call that x y and into the page is z that same core is going to experience stress in all directions right you're going to have something like that and then our z stresses here call it like that to say nothing of the shear stresses and then of course you get into stress transformations and finding the max points and you know more circle stuff I've got a video on all that but for now we'll just say that all these stresses exist in the material and so then the SED has to expand in order to meet this this situation and so the SED you know if you want to complete it fully then you would say it's one half and fortunately, it's very simple. They just sum up kind of in the very intuitive way. You have sigma, we'll call, we'll just abbreviate them. So sigma and epsilon here are the yield stresses and strains. I'm not going to write sigma yield x, sigma, you know, yield y, and so on. But they are the yields, and we just do the sum of them, right? Sigma y, epsilon y, sigma z, epsilon z. And so if any of these are zeros, you know, you just start slashing them out. And then, of course, you also have to add in the shears. So you can have shear x, y. Oh, boy, how do I draw that guy? That's a gamma x, y, right? The shear strain. And then you would continue to do those for the remaining shear stresses, right? But you get it. It's just a summation. And that will calculate your SED. And you can imagine it's much easier to look at just these two numbers instead of having to find functions for each of these. This triangular approximation really saved a lot of time there. So that's the practical aspect of it. That's if you ever want to calculate how much energy is being stored in the rock, that is how you would do it, right? But now to get into what this actually is, what the SED actually is, right? Well, I just said it, really. It's the sum of the energy that's stored in the rock. But that's not really appropriate, is it? Let's. My favorite way of looking at this is looking at the units that are involved, right? And so I'll erase some stuff here, and we'll get back to just that stress-strain curve. And when we look at that stress-strain curve, what we have is sigma and epsilon, of course. And you'll know that sigma... The units are force over area. And you know what? I'll throw our our European friends, well, scratch that, the entire rest of the world, the bone here, and do it in metric units. So that's going to be newtons per meter squared, right? A unit, a pascal, a kilopascal, some unit of stress. Newtons per meter squared. Force per unit area. And then epsilon is going to be length per length. So that'll be meters per meter, we'll call it. 
And remember that when we're doing this, we're, we're multiplying them together. And so sigma by epsilon, right? Whether you think of it as an integral or the area of a triangle where you're just multiplying two numbers together, what you're doing is, is either a direct multiplication or effectively a sum of an infinite number of little multiplications, right? And so putting these two units together, we have newtons per meter squared by meter over meter, right? And so what this is really saying, each stress by each differential strain, what this is, is a newton meter per meter cubed. So that is a unit of energy per unit of volume. And that happens each little time you increase your strain, right? So ultimately, it's just looking at a volumetric storage of energy and energy density as a result of strain. A newton meter, of course, then is a joule. So that's how we get all the way back to it. I like to think of it in that way of units, and again, it helps to write it out. Sometimes you think of strain as just a unitless thing, a percentage, but when you say meter over meter, okay, newton by meter, oh, that's a joule, and then meter squared by meter, oh, that's a meter cubed. Newton meter over meter cubed, joule per meter cubed. And that's where it becomes obvious what this is, an energy density, the energy that is being stored every time you strain it just a little bit further. Again, to me, that really kind of helps because seeing the relationships between stress, strain, and energy is useful. And of course, the reason why stressed rock has the ability to be so catastrophic, whether that's, you know, rock bursts or, you know, entire slabs of rock coming loose because there's no longer enough shearing stresses to keep them in place. Understanding that ultimately it's, it's energy that's down there, right? Even in this static rock mass that you see in an underground tunnel that you're excavating, you know, th for some big civil engineering project, or just, you know, a core of rock that you're drilling while exploring for, for oil, ultimately, when you get into the ground, you're seeing rock that is static, but stressed beyond, beyond belief, right? Hydrostatics apply all the same, and that puts a lot of energy into it. So, anyways... That's just enough theoretical stuff for now. That'll be, that'll be about it for this video. Hopefully that was informative, otherwise decent review for you. And stay tuned, we'll have more rock mechanics stuff coming in the future. It's been, it's been a lot of fun revisiting this.